We are down to our final two weeks on our series on the Ten Commandments, Vital Signs. One of our directives here at TFRC is biblical obedience. Scripture is the primary lens we use to determine how we live. In medicine, vital signs are indications of essential body functions, pulse, blood pressure, temperature, respiratory rate. Uh, They let us know if we are doing okay physically, and likewise, the Ten Commandments can be vital signs for following Jesus. They can tell us how we are doing in our faith in Jesus. Now, our culture is always tempting us to live by worldly values, and so we want to ground ourselves in biblical right and wrong, and a great place to start is the Ten Commandments. Now, we are saved by grace, not works. Obeying the Ten Commandments is not grounds for salvation, but Jesus affirmed the Ten Commandments, Jesus lived by the Ten Commandments, and he calls us to do the same. So using the Ten Commandments as vital signs indicate what is influencing us more, God's Word or our culture. Now, in this series, we've been looking at the Ten Commandments from Exodus 20. You can find them in Deuteronomy 5 as well. We are on the Ninth Commandment. And the scripture for this morning is Exodus 20, verse 16, and Acts 6, 8 to 13. You can go ahead and turn there uh, in your Bibles. Exodus is the second book of the Bible. Uh, The book of Acts is right after the four Gospels in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and then Acts. Uh, You can also look these passages up on your phone if you would like. But Exodus 20 gives the ninth command, and Acts chapter 6 introduces Stephen becoming the first martyr of the church. Um, Our scripture reader for this morning is Sarah Kazare, and so Sarah, go ahead and make your way on up to the podium. As she does, I'm going to ask if you're able, please stand and face the center of the room. Uh, We stand because we believe this is the word of God, and we read from the center of the room to remind us that scripture is to be central in our lives. And so, uh, Sarah, whenever you are ready, please read from Exodus 20 and Acts chapter 6. Exodus 20, 16. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. Acts 6, 8 through 13. Now Stephen, a man full of God's grace and power, performed great wonders and signs among the people. Opposition arose, however, from members of the synagogue of the freedmen, as it was called. Jews of Cyrene and Alexandria, as well as the province of Cilicia in Asia, who began to argue with Stephen. But they could not stand up against the wisdom the Spirit gave him as he spoke. Then they secretly persuaded some men to say, We have heard Stephen speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. So they stirred up the people and the elders and the teachers of the law. They seized Stephen and brought him before the Sanhedrin. They produced false witnesses who testified, This fellow never stopped speaking against this holy place and against the law. Sarah, thank you very much. You may be seated. Now, my favorite funny story about telling the truth is about a boy, and this boy and his family lived on top of a small hill that overlooked a lake, and this was back in the day before indoor plumbing, so they had an outhouse, and their outhouse was on top of the top of this small hill above the lake, and one day the boy was walking by the outhouse and he thought, I bet. If I push that outhouse down the hill, I could get it all the way to the lake. Now, he knew that he shouldn't do it, but the temptation just got the best of him. And so he looked around, make sure his parents weren't anywhere nearby, and he got a running start, and he pushed the outhouse as hard as he possibly could. And sure enough, the outhouse started to fall down the hill, and it got enough momentum as it tumbled down the hill that it made a loud splash when it got to the lake. Now, the boy was both thrilled and scared, and he just quickly ran away. And as the day went by, the boy did begin to feel guilty for what he had done. And his father came to him later that day and asked, Son, did you push the outhouse into the lake? And the son was grieved with guilt, and he thought about the story of George Washington and cutting down the cherry tree, and George Washington telling the truth to his dad. And so this boy said to his dad, like George Washington, I cannot tell a lie. I did push the outhouse into the lake. 
And the dad said sternly, well, son, for the next month, your chores are doubled and you are no longer allowed to play with your friends for that month as well. And the boy protested. He said, but dad, when George Washington told the truth, his dad didn't double his chores or keep him from his friends. But the dad said, well, yeah, but George Washington's dad wasn't in the tree when he cut it down. Sometimes telling the truth can be a painful thing to do. And it is much easier to simply lie. Whether it's a little white lie or a doozy of a lie. Now, when it comes to the weight of our words in regarding to being a false witness, I just want to begin with a clarification of what this command is addressing. What is breaking the ninth command, where it says in Exodus 20, you shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. Now, this command often gets misquoted as you shall not lie. That's not what the Bible says. It says, you shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. Now, a couple of weeks ago, I clarified the command, do not murder, because sometimes that particular command gets translated as do not kill, while murdering and killing are not the same thing. Murder is a kind of killing. All murder involves killing, but not all killing is murder. Well, likewise, this command doesn't say you shall not lie. Lying is just not telling the truth. So if I were to say, hey, look, my shirt is red, Well, that's a lie. But saying my shirt is red is not breaking the ninth command. The ninth command is a prohibition against false testimony. Now, false testimony is a kind of a lie. But not, so all false testimony involves lying, but not all lying is false testimony. And I'm not saying lying is okay. I'm just clarifying what the command is. Um, We have to understand, you know, we have to understand the command before we can obey it, right? So, false testimony is not just lying, it's a kind of lying, but it's also not quite the same thing as gossip. Gossip is spreading rumors about someone else. The truthfulness of the rumor is in question, but it's not necessarily spreading false information. You are simply sharing something that you have heard. Now, gossip is also prohibited in the Bible. We are not to be gossips. But gossiping is not quite the same thing as false witness against your neighbor. The word that best describes false witness is slander. Slander is a false and damaging statement about someone else. Slander is sharing something that you know isn't true. And slander is sharing something that you know will hurt someone's reputation. In fact, hurting someone's reputation is the motivation behind slander. For whatever reason, you want to tear another person down. You want to hurt their reputation. And maybe the reason is jealousy or revenge or greed. So you intentionally share something that is false and damaging to another person. It could also be a way of self-preservation, where maybe I've done something wrong, and this other person over here knows about it, so I'm going to slander them to keep the focus off of me. Uh, Some of you have noticed that I've been driving a different car, and I know this, that you've noticed it, because many of you have talked to me about it. Hey, I see you driving the little black car. What happened to the white expedition? Now, telling someone that I'm driving a different car, it's not slander, and it's not even gossip, because the truth of that is not in question. I'm driving a different car. Now, if someone said, well, Pastor Chuck bought a new car, well, that would be a rumor because uh, you don't know that I bought a new car. I could have be renting it. I might have borrowed it. The truth of that is in question. So that would be a rumor. Maybe it's borderline gossip. That's a pretty harmless example of gossip because if you're gossiping about me buying a car, your life is pretty boring, right? So, but if someone were to say, Pastor Chuck stole the car, Well, that's slander. It is false and damaging to me. False witness isn't just lying. It's not just gossip. It is slander, making a false statement in order to hurt someone else. Just to put your mind at ease, I still have the white expedition. We bought that black car for my daughter, just in case anyone's wondering. Um, Now, we live in a culture where rumor and slander, they get intermixed. We love hearing juicy things about other people, whether they are true or not especially if those other things make people look bad. 
Now, we will complain, oh, the traditional news media, all they ever do is report bad news. But come on, why do they only report bad news? It's because bad news sells. We like to hear it. And we love tabloid journalism. News about the private affairs of famous people, that, especially if it makes them look bad. We love that stuff. And the primary question shouldn't be, well, hey, why is our culture like that? The primary question should be, why is sometimes the church like that? Because it's one thing for the culture to enjoy when bad things happen to others and spread it around. It's another thing for followers of Jesus to do it. And like murder, adultery, stealing, slander is a violation of others. And when we think about evil, what is the one person that we typically associate with evil more than most? Well, when we think about a personification of evil, we think of the devil. The devil is evil personified. Now, the word used in the New Testament for that gets translated as devil is diabolos. And the word diabolos literally means slanderer. So the devil is a slanderer, tells lies about people in order to hurt them, giving false testimony about someone else is a big deal. It is never harmless. And when we do it, we are using the devil's go-to move. So we don't often appreciate the weight of our words. You know, it's an old cliche, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. That's a bunch of baloney. We, we know that words are powerful. As it says in Proverbs 18, the tongue has the power of life and death. What we say and how we say things can impact someone for their whole lives. I remember when I was a kid, a teacher yelling at me in front of the whole class. I was seven years old. And I can still tell you what she was mad at me for. I also remember when I was nine, and a teacher complimenting me on my singing voice. That was a long time ago. No one would compliment me on my singing voice now, just for the record. But those two events, they happened over 40 years ago. I still remember them. Remember how they made me feel. Now, the teacher that yelled at me, she just lost her temper. She wasn't trying to be mean. And the teacher who complimented me was just trying to encourage me. I'm sure that neither of them even remember either of those instances. They never thought that I would remember those things for the rest of my life, but I do. Our words have great power. The tongue has the power of life and death. And we get to choose how to use our words. We can use our words to build up or tear down. We can use our words to encourage others focus on what others are doing right, or we can be critical of others and focus on what they do wrong. We can use our words to give good advice and graciously give constructive criticism, or we can name call, put others down, make sure that they know we are better than them. We can express words of sympathy and empathy. We can use our words to let others know that we understand so that they know that whatever it is they're feeling or experiencing isn't crazy so that they know that they're not alone. Or we can be callous with our words, minimize what others experience by telling them it's not so bad or telling them their accomplishments really aren't that big of a deal. We can be positive with our words, we can be negative with our words, but don't ever think that our words don't matter. They always will. I hope that 40 years from now, there is someone who will remember something encouraging that I said to them that made a positive difference in their lives. But based upon how often our words are positive or how often they are negative, what are the chances that years from now someone will remember a positive thing you said to them? Or what are the chances that years from now 
someone will remember a negative thing you said to them. Now, I've always considered myself a witty person, which is just a kind way of saying that I'm a smart aleck. And so I have to be intentional with being positive because it doesn't always come natural to me. And a caution for all of us is to not minimize the power of our words. We must be intentional. So think about the things we say to others. Evaluate the potential impact it could make because the tongue has the power of life and death. We need to remember the weight of our words. But there's also a weight to our witness. Now, when I say a weight to our witness, I'm not specifically referring to our witness for Christ, at least not at this point, but rather the weight of our witness in regards to what it is we say about others. For centuries, witnesses have played a significant role when it comes to the justice system. And you even see this in Scripture, as it says in Deuteronomy 19. One witness is not enough to convict anyone accused of any crime um, or offense that they may have committed. But a matter must be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. Now, this is something that Jesus will actually quote. A matter is to be established by the testimony of two to three witnesses. So if a crime has been committed and there are witnesses to it, the t testimony of two or three witnesses could render someone guilty. The testimony of two to three witnesses could sentence a person to death. And even in the day of age, even in our day and age of cameras, where almost anywhere we go, we are being recorded, the power of the testimony of witnesses is still strong. And it's not just true in the justice system. It's true in every aspect of our lives. You see, a truthful witness brings life, even if the truth we have to share is hard to hear. I love the saying, the facts are our friends. <laughs> Even facts that may be bad news for us, it's always better to know the facts than to not know them. Proverbs 27 says, wounds from a friend can be trusted, but an enemy multiplies kisses, meaning an enemy will be more than happy to tell us what we want to hear, but it takes a real friend to tell us the hard truth. And if a friend of yours thinks you are wrong about something and they are able to tell you in a kind, truthful way, those people are invaluable. A friend who can tell you the hard truth in a way that you can receive it, those are the rare people that you need to keep around because they are for you, not against you. And they're willing to tell you something hard to hear because they care about you and believe it will help you. See, truthful witnesses bring life. And a false witness brings death. It's called character assassination. When you don't tell the truth about someone else, when you lie about what they did or didn't do, again, like murder and stealing, you violate them. You violate them by attacking their reputation. And attacking someone's reputation is just another way of negating their existence. When someone has a bad reputation, while their, their opinion matters less, what they think or say matters less, they matter less. And it can literally lead to death. Going back to Acts chapter 6, where it said, Now Stephen, a man full of God's grace and power, performed great wonders and signs among the people. Opposition arose, however, from members of the synagogue of the freedmen, as it was called. Jews of Cyrene and Alexandria, as well as the provinces of Cilicia and Asia, who began to argue with Stephen, but they could not stand up against the wisdom the Spirit gave him as he spoke. Then they secretly persuaded some men to say, we have heard Stephen speak blasphemous words against Moses and God. So they stirred up the people and the elders and the teachers of the law. They seized Stephen brought him before the Sanhedrin, and they produced false witnesses who testified, this fellow never stopped speaking against this holy place and against the law. So Stephen is performing these great wonders and signs, and this opposition arises, but they can't stand up against his wisdom. And so they produced false witnesses. Notice, 
it was more than one. Matters are established on the basis of two to three witnesses. And they slander Stephen, saying he spoke against the law and the holy place. Stephen never did that. It was a lie about his actions. And later in the chapter, Stephen is killed because of their slander. Their slander literally led to his death. Now, do you think that when those particular false witnesses stood before God and gave an account of their actions, that they would be able to deny that Stephen's blood was on their hands? No. Their blood, or Stephen's blood, was on their hands. And here is the danger of slander. If we slander someone, anything negative that happens to that person because of our slander is on our hands. If someone loses a job because of our slander, that's on us. If someone loses a friendship because of our slander, that's on us. If someone loses a marriage because of our slander, that's on us. Slander is a serious offense. Safeguarding the truth about one another is vital in following Jesus. A false witness leads to death. And Jesus said, you shall be my witnesses. Our lives witness to the truthfulness of Christ. And sometimes, I would argue many times, we are good witnesses for Jesus. But sometimes we're not. A false witness leads to death. Maybe the death of someone's potential faith. And Christians, we have a reputation of being hypocrites where we are not really living at what we claim to believe. That's another form of being a false witness where we do not live by the truth we claim to live by. And any time that someone will say something like that to me, my immediate response is, you know something? Guilty as charged. Sometimes I'm a bad witness. Now, many times, we are great witnesses. Let's not be too harsh. But there are times when we're not. So, you know, let's just tell the truth about ourselves. Sometimes, yeah, we're hypocrites. That's the truth about us. Not all the time, not even most of the time. But sometimes, sure. And let's just admit it. <laughs> when we are, and strive to do better. Jesus died for our sins. Jesus rose from the dead. And that good news changes everything because God's word is reliable and trustworthy. While our words are not always reliable, God's word is. 2,000 years ago, Jesus promised his disciples that he would be with them through the end of the age. And Jesus continues to be with us through the end of the age. From generation to generation, God has kept his promises to us. And Jesus is a true witness to the character of God. And Jesus knows the truth about us, the good and the bad. And he is faithful to us no matter what. And that has been true in the past it is true now, and it will continue to be true to the end of the age. God's word is true and reliable. And he expects our words to be true and reliable as well. You shall not give false testimony about your neighbor. Please pray with me. And Lord, I would ask that you would make us mindful of the things that we say. Lord, give us um, eyes to see the potential good or harm that our careless words could cause. And help us to be intentional. That whether we're just being encouraging to someone or whether we're sharing a hard truth with someone or whether we're talking about someone, that we would be truthful in our words. And it's in the name of Jesus, our Lord, we pray. Amen. Receive God's blessing. 
May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.